Scientists successfully perform a memory transplant between living organisms. Steve McCamley on Collective Spark reports. Well, see, they're trying to um, create immortality, obviously. Now, animal testing is extremely heartbreaking. All beings, in my opinion, are intelligent, emotional, and have the ability to feel deeply. All life on this planet is so similar in so many ways. And these days, living life forms are bred for experimentation and consumption. This not only harms the being in what some would perceive as an extreme act of cruelty, but in many cases it's harming the integrity of our planet when it comes to environmental issues and human health as well. This is why I'm always very confident when presenting information that's discovered through some type of testing that's done on another being. There are other ways scientists can conduct studies without the use of life forms, live life forms. And the last time I was conflicted about sharing this type of information was when scientists injected aluminum into animals, mimicking the childhood vaccine schedule to see what the difference between injected and ingested aluminum was and where it ends up in the body. And you can read more about it in the link here. Kindly support my Patreon account since YouTube has again demonetized my YouTube channel. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below. Now, Theodora Capaldo is president of the New England Anti-Vaccination Society. Founded in 1895, NAVS is a Boston-based national animal advocacy organization dedicated to ending the use of animals in research, testing, and science education. Through research, outreach, education, legislation, and policy changes, NAVS advocates for replacing animals with modern alternatives that are ethically, humanely, and scientifically superior. It's one of many organizations bringing alternatives to light it's a big time bioethics issue that I just wanted to mention this before getting into the subject matter at hand. What happened? This may be old information to some, but I recently came across it. In 2018, a team of researchers successfully transplanted memories in snails by transforming, transferring a form of genetic information called RNA from one snail into another. The snails were trained to develop a response to a mild electric shock to their tails, and after these shocks were administered, the snails' defensive withdrawal reflex, where the snails contract or curl up to protect themselves from harm, became more pronounced. Yes, again, that's extremely cruel. The thought of inflicting any type of pain or fear response in another living being is heartbreaking, but that's just my opinion. The snails exhibited a defense contraction lasting about 50 seconds. The researchers extracted RNA from the nervous system of the snails that had been shocked and injected the material into the snails that had not been shocked. RNA's main role, from what we know, and there is a lot that we don't know, is to serve as a messenger inside of the cells. It carries protein-making instructions from DNA. When the RNA was injected into the, the unshocked snails, the snails also had the same type of response as shocked snails for an extended period of time after a soft touch, something they, did, they were not doing before. They were reacting to something that had never happened to them. Control snails that received injections of RNA from snails that had not received shocks did not exhibit a response for as long. Now, the researchers also showed that Apoplesia sensory neurons in petri dishes that had been shocked were more excitable if they were exposed to RNA from the shocked snails. Exposure to RNA from snails that had never been shocked did not cause the cells to become more excitable. The results, said Glassman, suggested that memories may be stored within the nucleus of neurons, where the RNA is synthesized and can act on the DNA to turn genes on and off. He said he thought memory storage involved these epigenetic changes, changes in the activity of genes and not in the DNA sequences that make up those genes that are mediated by RNA. 
Now, it's also interesting to know that Michael Levine at Tufts has replicated McDonald's experiments on headless worms under more controlled settings. Glassman said one of McDonald's students, Al Jacobson, demonstrated the transfer of memories between flatworms via RNA injections, coincidentally while an assistant professor at UCLA. The work was published in Nature in 1966, but Jacobson never received tenure, perhaps because of dubious uh, about the doubts about his findings, and the experiment was, however, replicated in rats shortly afterward. Another example, Steve Ramirez, a 24-year-old doctoral student at the time, placed the mouse in a small metal box with a black plastic floor. Instead of curiously sniffing around, though, the animal instantly froze in terror, recalling the experience of receiving a foot shock in that small box. It was a textbook fear response, and if anything, the mouse posture was more rigid than Ramirez had expected. Its memory of the trauma must have been quite vivid. Which was amazing, because the memory was bogus. The mouse had never received an electric shock in that box. Rather, it was reacting to a false memory that Ramirez and his MIT colleague Xu Liu had planted in his brain. So what does this tell us? Can living organisms transfer memory? Yes, we already know that living organisms can transfer memory. For example, a Nature Neuroscience study published several years ago showed mice trained to avoid a smell pass their aversion on to their children as well as their grandchildren. This study dealt with phobia and anxiety research as the animals were trained to fear a smell similar to cherry blossom. The researchers then looked at the mice's sperm and found that the section of DNA responsible for sensitivity to the cherry blossom scent was much more active in the sperm. And as a result, the offspring were extremely sensitive to cherry blossom and would avoid the scent despite never having experienced it in their lives. The experience of a parent, even before conceiving, markedly influenced both structure and function in the nervous system of subsequent generations. This is what the report concludes. Research has since showed that memories and behaviors may actually be passed down 14 generations. This is very important, and it suggests that a number of memories can be passed down from our previous generations, including fear, anxiety, trauma, perhaps susceptibility to substances like alcohol, for example, and much more. And this opens up a wide plethora of discussions when it comes to human behavior in general. What's more important to recognize is that what's encoded into our DNA and into our genes also has the ability to be changed using the power of our own mind. There's a lot of evidence emerging suggesting that thoughts, feelings, and emotions can change our DNA. This also corroborates with the research posted above, given the fact that emotions like fear are used. So my question is, what happens when the organism overcomes that fear and does not react in the same way? What happens when it makes a conscious choice to perceive events in a different manner? Imagine what love, peace, and other positive emotions can do and if uh, we can code fear, anxiety, and trauma into our DNA and pass them on, can an organism change that by changing themselves within and training themselves to experience more joyful types of experience and or mind and heart state? Scientists have shown that the feeling of gratitude, for example, can literally change the structure of the human brain. According to Heart Math Institute, the power of intentional thoughts and emotions goes beyond theory at the Heart Math Institute. In a study, researchers tested this idea and proven its veracity. Heart Math researchers have gone so far to show that physical aspects of DNA strands could be influenced by human intention. The article, Modulation of DNA Confirmation by Heart-Focused Intention, McCarty, Atkinson, Tomasino, 2003, described experiments that achieved these types of results. For example, an individual holding three DNA samples was directed to generate heart coherence, a beneficial state of mental, emotional, and physical balance and harmony with the aid of a heart math technique that utilizes heart breathing and intentional positive emotions. The individual succeeded, as instructed, to intentionally and simultaneously 
unwind two of the DNA samples to different extents and leave the third one unchanged. The results provide experimental evidence to support the hypothesis that the aspects of the DNA molecule can be altered through intentionality, the article states. The data indicate that when individuals are in a heart-focused loving state and in a more coherent mode of physiological functioning, they have a greater ability to alter the conformation of the DNA. Individuals capable of generating high ratios of heart coherence are able to alter DNA conformation according to their intention. Control group participants showed low ratios of heart coherence and were unable to intentionally, intentionally alter the conformation of the DNA. Now, as far as memory goes, perhaps they're not even completely a product of our physical makeup. Who is to say that human consciousness, for example, resides in the brain? Perhaps there is no, uh, there is a non-physical aspect or a place we cannot perceive with our senses where memories and experiences are stored. After all, memories themselves, despite having physical characteristics, as exemplified in the study, are in a sense themselves non-physical things. DNA has also been shown to have some non-physical aspects, and you can read about them in the examples, in the link here. The mind-body connection is also gaining traction. As Garth Cook from Scientific American points out, he says, a growing body of scientific research suggests that our mind can play an important role in healing our body or in staying healthy in the first place. There are now several lines of research suggesting that our mental perception of the world constantly informs and guides our immune system in a way that makes us better able to respond to future threats. That was a sort of aha moment for me where the idea of an entwined mind and body suddenly made more scientific sense than an ephemeral consciousness somehow separates us from our physical selves. The mind-body connection suggests that we can change our biological our biology through belief, which is get, suggests we can break the cycle of negative aspects we've inherited through epigenetics. These types of interventions require a shift in human consciousness and a shift in perception. And you can read, suggested reading, The Biology of Belief. So when it comes to learning about the human body connection and its relationship to our health, it can be difficult to choose a starting place amongst the vast and growing body of research. One of the best places to start, however, is the placebo effect, which demonstrates that the mind can create physiological changes in the body. Neuroscientist Fabrizio Benetti explains, there is not just one placebo effect, but many. Placebo painkillers can trigger the release of neural pain-relieving chemicals called endomorphins. Patients with Parkinson's disease respond to placebos with a flood of dopamine. Fake oxygen given to someone at altitude has been shown to cut levels of neurotransmitters called prostaglandins, which dilate blood vessels, among other things, and are responsible for many of the symptoms of altitude sickness. And this goes to show that based on our thoughts alone and how we perceive our environment, we can alter our biology. Then there's the idea that thoughts and human intention can alter physical systems. If thoughts can alter physical systems, imagine what they can do to our biology as well as the body of another. And for more information, you can read Distant Healing Intention Therapies, an overview of the scientific evidence. There's also multiple credible reports of mind-matter interaction beyond the quantum scale where we already know it exists, and you can read about it there in the link. The conclusion, the takeaway is, at the end of the day, the evidence showing that our memories can be transferred down many generations is quite strong. And what seems to be left out of the mainstream conversation is the importance of our perceptions. Our environment, yes, plays a key role in shaping our biology, but we can begin to counteract the effect of our environment, especially if it's negative, by changing our perception of that environment. We're not bound by the genetics we inherit from our ancestors. We can actively change them. If mice are trained to fear the smell of a certain substance, for example, yes, their offspring also fear it, but they are not doomed to that destiny. The mouse that can expand its consciousness and think and realize that there is no reason to be afraid is the one that then changes their DNA. 
The science of human consciousness, also known as non-material science, is advancing quite rapidly, and it goes to show that if more of us can operate, or at least make an effort to operate from a place of peace within, we can truly make the world a better place, as well as transform our biology. The term change comes from within, comes in many forms, and if you look at the modern history of the human race, although there are many beautiful aspects and memories, there's also a lot of trauma. As a human collective, we still have a lot of work to do on ourselves, and I believe we're currently going through that process, and I believe it's being triggered by the fact that more people are having a big change in how they perceive their environment. This was originally for Collective Evolution, published here under Creative Commons on Collective Spark. Thank you for your support, and please leave your comments.